Uh, hope everyone's having a great week so far, beginning of November. Uh, we've got a great lineup today. Uh, we've got Ethan Lang uh, from Playfair Data uh, hanging out with us today. He's going to talk about some uh, layered graphics, uh, which I think is uh, is going to be really neat. I've only seen a, a little bit of it, uh, only seen a few sneak peeks, so I'm excited to hear about it. And then after that, we're going to, uh, if you're not aware, uh, and you should be, uh, Tableau Conference virtual next, next week uh, from the 9th to the 12th. Uh, and it is completely free. Uh, all you have to do is sign up and uh, select some stuff to watch. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, briefly go around the panel uh, here and give you some tips and tricks on how to make the most of hopefully our last uh, virtual conference. Uh, I really hope next year we're back in person um, because I'm just about done with virtual conferences. Um, and then uh, we'll uh, and then we'll just wrap it up and uh, and go from there. So without any further ado, oh, before I get started, don't forget chat and Q and a. Chat is for general uh, for general comments, plus ones when you hear something cool, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then Q and a, if you have a specific question for Ethan, drop that in the Q and a, and we'll uh, we'll get those answered at the end of the presentation. So without any further ado, take it away. Oh, yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, couple things real quick. First, thanks, Sean and and the rest of the team here for the invitation. Really appreciate it. Excited to be talking to Kansas City. I was just scrolling through the panelists, or excuse me, the attendee list, and I saw some familiar names. So <clears throat> definitely good to uh, see some friendly faces in the crowd. Um, also, I want to thank everybody in the audience for attending today. I know your time is valuable, so I really appreciate you joining us and hearing what we have to say. Hopefully, I can provide some value and uh, give you some tips and tricks on things you can incorporate in your own work. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. So like Sean mentioned, my name is Ethan Lang. I'm the Senior Manager of Analytics Engineering at Playfair Data. Um, I'm also a co-lead of the Veterans Advocacy Tableau User Group. Uh, we're a pretty unique group. Um, really, our, our mission is to create a, a community where veterans can come and they can, um, they can network, they can find a mentor, maybe find a mentee, um, a place where they can learn tips and tricks uh, maybe break into the data viz industry if they're transitioning out of the military. But more importantly, we like to team up with different organizations and we will help them by grabbing data from them and passing that off to our, our members to visualize that data, um, very similar to what uh, Viz for Social Good does. So, but the, the organizations we work with are specific around either advocating for veterans or veteran owned. Um, organizations. We just kicked off our, our first kind of data challenge yesterday, so it's pretty exciting. If you guys are interested in that, let me know after the presentation. I'll send you some uh, inf information around that. I'm also a member of the Tableau Speaker Bureau. So this is something that Tableau started last year, and really it's just a program where um, Tableau asked the community uh, for volunteers if, if people were interested in speaking at different events. This could be speaking at the Tableau conference or speaking to a user group like this today. Um, so again, if, if anybody has uh, connections or looking for a speaker for different events, definitely feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help or at least connect you with the folks that um, can get to, to the person you're looking for that maybe tailor that uh, presentation to that audience. But enough about me, let's jump into what we came here to hear about, um, the six components of layered graphics. Really, this is just a fancy way to, to say there's a step-by-step -step process and kind of the fundamental, um, the way that Tableau kind of walks you through building a data visualization are based on these kind of fundamental um, ideas. So this is a concept and many of us probably apply this concept every day if we're working in Tableau without even really realizing it. So let's take a look at what that actually is. So the first layer of this, um, kind of approach is the data layer. So this is where you would go, you would find data, um, you're gonna connect to it. If we think about Tableau, the first thing Tableau does when we open it up for the first time 
is it asks you to connect to data. Um, so really this is the first step in, in creating a data visualization. The next is uh, choosing a mark type. So once you have your data, how do you wanna encode that data into the view? And again, Tableau does a great job of kind of guiding us through this process, right? Once we connect to our data, we can just drag in a few pills and, and Tableau will automatically build a visualization um, tailored around whatever we're dragging into the view. The next layer is adding in aesthetics. And you'll see as we kind of go through, each layer is adding more and more context to either your analysis or the story you're trying to convey within your data visualization. And aesthetics is probably my favorite. I think this is where we can really start flexing our analytical chops. Um, you know, anybody can open up Tableau and build a bar chart, but it takes a little bit of technique and skill to work in color and shape and size and, and those kind of um, aesthetics into the view to really drive home what you're trying to convey. The fourth layer is filtering and subplotting. Um, so this one's pretty simple and straightforward, but essentially as we're going up the, up the chart here and adding in more layers and more context, filtering is gonna allow the user to really start chopping up the data in different ways um, and start getting into a, a deeper understanding of what's in the data and the story that they can tell with it. The fifth layer is statistics. So this is where we can start adding a lot of really powerful in inference on our data. Um, and making really powerful data-driven decisions um, that are backed up by statistics and math. Uh, so again, just adding more context. And the last layer is theme. Um, of all the layers, I think Tableau does a really good job with all of them, except this one. So theme is where you're gonna start adding in design elements um, into your charts and into your data visualizations um, to drive adoption of the tool or to incorporate branding um, or to just make it more visually appealing. And like I said, and I'll touch a little bit more on this as we get into each of these in detail, uh, but I do just wanna call out, this is the one that I think Tableau really lacks is in the theme, uh, the theme layer. All right, so before we dive into a little bit more detail, I do wanna give you a brief history of this idea. I have to admit, I did not come up with it. Um, this is just a, kind of a presentation I've put together doing research of my own um, and stuff that I've found throughout my process or throughout my journey um, leading me up to this um, event, really. So the first kind of the most recent, I should say, um, mention of this idea of layering in graphics, I found it, it was a book published by Hadley Wickham called ggplot2. If you're familiar with R code, there's a famous library called ggplot2 and that library's sole purpose is to build and visualize data. And he created that library using these fundamental ideas of layering in these graphics um, where you would layer in your data and then you choose your mark type. Um, it's, it's really the, the foundation of that library. But from what I found, he's actually picked this idea up from another author named Leland Wickelson, who published a book called The Grammar of Graphics. It's a really cool book. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Uh, but you can even see where Hadley Wickham kind of tips his hat to this other author. The GG and ggplot2, it actually stands for Grammar of Graphics. Um, so you can see he kind of picked up on these ideas um, from Wickelson in this book and applied them um, building out this library. But beyond these two recent events, this, this idea goes, goes far back and really to kind of the dawn of the digital age. Um, when we start, first started getting into computing and, and really with the personal computer, you know, folks were trying to figure out how do we visualize data using these, these, um, this new technology. And this, this whole approach was really the foundation of that. You know, like you would encode your data you would encode what mark type you wanna to use to visualize that data. You would add in aesthetics and it's just a step-by-step -step where you're just layering these things on. What's interesting is, is a lot of the modern data visualization tools today like Tableau apply these same fundamental, um, the same fundamental process in their tools. And you can see that um, even as you kind of work through the authoring interface of Tableau Desktop, um, that it kind of walks you through each of those things kind of unknowingly. So that's a little bit about the history. Let's dive into the first layer. 
Layer one is data. And I think this layer is pretty self-explanatory, but there's a few basics that I wanna to touch on here. Um, one being, being that there's different types of data you can connect to. So you have unstructured data, you have structured data. Examples of unstructured data, I think we've all seen this, especially if you worked in the finance world. Um, it'll be an Excel file where we maybe have dates across the top. There's no column headers. Um, there's entire columns that their sole purpose is just to create a border between labels, um, different things like that. This is a good example of unstructured data. If we were to load this into Tableau, we might be able to use it, but it's not gonna be very sufficient. Other examples of unstructured data are like PDF files or emails or even images, videos, and audio files. Structured data, however, you can see this is a really good example of um, really each column represents a specific variable. Uh, we have column headers here. You can see we don't have any null values or any unused columns that are just blank. Um, and good examples of this, you can find them in spreadsheets. CSVs are always going to be a good example of a structured data source most of the time. Um, hopefully, if you're connecting to like a SQL server, hopefully it's structured, I would hope. Um, but really, with structured data, there's kind of three rules of thumb um, that I follow to make sure that I, I'm working with a structured data set. The first rule of thumb is that each column represents a unique variable. So we can see that highlighted here. The second rule of thumb is that each row would represent an, a unique observation within the data. And the third is that all of our data is filled in. We don't have any nulls or blank values and that each cell has a unique value within it. Now, if you do find that you're working with unstructured data, there's plenty of program, programs and software that can help you structure the data. Um, some of the most popular ones we're familiar with in our line of work is Alteryx, Tableau Prep, uh, but you could even go as far as coding in and, and structuring your data using code like R or Python. Um, if you have access, uh, you can also use SQL um, to code in a structured data set. So once you get your data structured, again, this is more basic stuff here for the data layer, but we have two things we're working with, right? We have measures and we have dimensions. And a measure can be defined as a numeric quantitative value that can be measured. A dimension, however, is, quali or is defined as a qualitative field that can describe your measures. So some good examples of measures are things like sales or maybe an aggregation like the sum of sales. A dimension, however, a good example of that would be date or order ID, customer name those kinds of things. A great example I've heard to kind of define the differences between these. If I drug in to my view, the sum of sales, and I, I found that I had $10 million in sales, I might be feeling really good about that. Matter of fact, I, I would be off, like blown off the wall if that, if that were happening. Um, however, if I drug in date into that same view and I saw I made $8 million in sales last year and only 2 million this year, well, that changes my, my perception quite a bit. Um, I might not be feeling pretty good about that. So you can see kind of the relationship between them. The dimensions are really used to drive more context and to define and, and kind of qualitative or quali excuse me, describe your measures. So throughout this presentation, and right now it's completely blank, but I'm gonna be flashing up a workbook I've created that's adding in these layers. So you can see at the bottom here, I've added in the first layer, which is the data layer, which right now we, we're just working with a blank workbook because we, we have the data, but we haven't visualized anything in the tool. I'll move on to the second layer. This is mark type. And when I say mark type, I, I really mean the chart type. Like, how do you want to visualize your data and encode the marks on the view? So Tableau, like I mentioned earlier, they really make it easy for the users to visualize data even. Anybody can, can open up Tableau Desktop or Tableau Public, drag in a few pills, connect the data, drag in a few pills on the view, and they'll have a bar chart or a line chart. Um, they make it extremely easy to do that. 
However, if you want to take it to the next step, um, you can manually encode your marks. On the marks card, if you select this drop down, you'll be able to pick what mark type you want your marks encoded by. To take it a step even further, um, Tableau is built in the Show Me tab, where depending on what measures and dimensions you have on the view, you can simply click one of these options and it will, will encode the marks um, in that chart type. Um, so it makes it incredibly easy to visualize data. Taking a step even further, we all know that Tableau is extremely versatile. Um, you're not just limited to the mark types that are there. Uh, there's hundreds of different chart types that you can build using Tableau. One of the best repositories of these chart types that I've found um, was this Tableau Public uh, published by Kevin Flairledge. It has 100 chart types and uh, images of each of those chart types, so you can easily browse through. But what I love about this is you can click on any of these. It will take you to that workbook. And most of the time, you're able to download that workbook, and you can kind of re-engineer what that author did. So this is a great resource that you can use to go through uh, maybe a, looking for inspiration if you're looking at building a new data visualization, or maybe you just want to start flexing your skills and learning new chart types. Um, Tableau makes it extremely easy to do that using resources that the communities put out there. And I did want to credit just a few other authors. Um, Kevin actually credits them in his workbook, so I figured I'd do the same. But he compiled this, this workbook that he published um, using some work that some other individuals put out there. I think we're all familiar with uh, the visual vocabulary by Andy Kreeble um, or Tableau Reference Guide by Jeff Schaffer, uh, Tableau Cookbook from Josh Weyburn. Um, so quite a few resources out there that do very similar things. Um, me personally, I liked Kevin's just because it was a little bit more visual. However, each of these have their own kind of unique way that they guide the user through picking a chart type. So recommend checking them all out and especially bookmarking them all for future use. All right, so now that we're looking at, you know, we've added in our data, let's turn on the mark type layer. You can see here, I've, I've chosen a line chart to encode my marks and we're looking at the close price of a stock by day. Uh, so at this point, at this layer, this is what we would have built in Tableau um, at this point. The next layer is layer three, the aesthetics layer. And like I mentioned prior, I think this is the layer where us as Tableau developers can really start flexing our chops and showing you know, our analytical skills. Um, like I said, it, anybody can come in, connect to data, build a bar chart, super easy. However, you know, not a lot of folks know how to maybe encode a, a calculated field that looks at, let's say the top 10 um, customers and highlights them within a view. Um, those kinds of things, they take skill and tact. Um, so I, I really do think that this is probably one of the most powerful layers, um, especially for anybody that's really had, had time to kind of go through Tableau and learn the tool itself. So let's dive in. So to touch on the aesthetics, I'm just gonna quickly go through some of these um, and some highlight some of the ones I think are more important. Um, then again, I mean, they, they all have their own importance, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I do think that there's some that, um, you know, we can use to, to highlight different things a lot better and it will draw the attention of the user more cleanly than others. The first one, and probably from my opinion, the most powerful is color. Um, color is an extremely powerful way to drive the attention of your audience to specific things on your dashboard. Um, what I love about this aesthetic is you can click on the color marks card here and if you wanted to add in your own branding or incorporate your organization's branding, you can do that by clicking more colors, um, typing in those custom hex codes. You can change the transparency or opacity of these colors, and you can also add borders onto color. And like I mentioned, this is an extremely easy way to draw the user's attention to the story you're trying to convey within your data visualization. The next aesthetic I think is extremely powerful is shape. Um, shape can be, again, an extremely good way of drawing the user's attention to something. The example I always think of is, for instance, if I was looking at a scatter plot of different IT companies on a scatter plot, if I encoded the shape 
as the IT company's logo, that could really draw insight a lot quicker for the audience if they're familiar with those brands. Um, so again, I think shape is another incredibly powerful aesthetic we can incorporate into our data visualizations. The next is size. Size, I think paired with color and shape can be incredibly powerful. One thing I like to do with size is not only size like specific points, but you know, if I'm working with a line chart, I might just increase the thickness of the line chart a bit. Um, there's all kinds of different things that you can use or incorporate um, using size. The next is axes. And I think this one above all else gets looked overlooked probably the most, but I do think it has a very unique, uh, powerful um, purpose within our data visualizations to draw context from. For one, um, you can come in here and you can fix the axes. Um, you can remove the, the zero. I'd be careful with that. Um, there are some pitfalls with doing stuff like that. But where I find myself using axes and editing them uh, the most is title and the tick marks. For title, for me as a developer, I make a lot of Tableau calculated fields and what I name them, they make a lot of sense to me personally. But from a user perspective, that might not make sense to them at all. So from here, I can edit the title and I can, I can kind of tailor it to the audience. I can also start adding in subtitles in the axes. Maybe I wanted to have a subtitle of where this data was coming from. This is a great, great place to just kind of plug that in. Another awesome part of editing uh, the axes is the tick marks. You know, we're always constantly trying to reduce the amount of ink on our data visualizations and being able to limit maybe the tick marks is a great way to incorporate an axis, but also keep it very minimal. Um, and you can do that right from here. Again, I think this is a, a really good aesthetic that often gets overlooked. Now, these next four are pretty self-explanatory, so I'll touch on them very briefly. Um, labels, obviously, it's going to add a label to the marks on your view. Um, just a couple things to keep in mind here. If you click on the label card, um, what I've always found useful is being able to add, for instance, if I wanted to add labels to the min and max uh, point on a line, on a line chart, you can do that directly from the labels card. Um, it's ex extremely easy um, and a really good way to highlight some of those, those values. Another is the details marks card. So this is where you can start changing the level of granularity within your view. So if we're looking at, say, category and we wanted to look at product name, you would simply drop product name into detail and you're most likely looking at that level of granularity now. Um, tooltip, extremely useful, especially with the, introdu the introduction of Invis tooltips. It's a great way to draw context into your view and bring more, more data at hand to the user. Also, another great tip on tooltips if we have a lot of marks on the view, you know, we don't necessarily want to label, you know, 1500 marks on a view. Adding a tooltip, however, will allow the user to kind of briefly look at each value and see what the underlying data is there. Um, so again, a great way to, to draw an aesthetic to the view that drives uh, context and drives the analyses. The last one is angle. And before anyone starts jumping in and trying to yell at me for selling them on a pie chart, I'm not. Um, angle is a great aesthetic, especially when you start working with some more advanced chart types, um, like a polygon, or maybe you're doing radial pie charts and things like this, or bar charts. Um, you'll incorporate angle quite a bit when you start getting into some of those more advanced um, chart types. And this is really what will drive like curvature to your view and, and to your data when you encode that mark. Um, so it can be a really useful aesthetic. All right, so that covers the aesthetics. You can see here, going back to our, our tool as we're slowly building through it, I've turned on the third layer here. Um, I've added color to the view. So now we can see, um, looking across, we can see the where we're going up and down throughout each one of those days. And maybe we can start looking and, and just tech, checking out trends um, based on that. All right, layer four is filtering. And this one, I. I would say is extremely self-explanatory. Um, so I'll just cover it with a brief kind of example. So in my example, I have that same chart that I just showed you. 
I've added filter here and what it allows us to do, like I mentioned earlier, it allows our users and us as analysts to kind of chop the data up and kind of drive that insight and take a look around and kind of um, get more context by looking at it at different ways. So the example I've built here is pretty easy. On the left, we have stock A and we can see that stock A has had a major uptick um, starting at about November 1. Um, but it's starting to trend down uh, moving into January. On the right, however, we filtered to stock B. We can see it's had the same kind of uptick, but it's still going. Um, so at this point, by incorporating filter, we've what we've allowed our user to do is to start making data-driven dri decisions on which stock type or which stock they would want to buy. So for instance, if I wanted to buy stock A, I might wait till it hits a low and starts working its way back up before I purchase that. Or I might buy stock B because it's forecasting to kind of go up a little bit more. So maybe I can buy it at this price and hopefully I'll have a payday um, in the next few periods. So again, turning on that, that fourth layer, um, I've added, um, it's very subtle, but I've added filtering to our view here. So now we can filter between stock A, stock B, stock C, so on. Layer five is the statistics layer. Like I mentioned, this one is extremely powerful if you know what you're doing. Um, I would definitely recommend doing a little bit of research. However, again, Tableau makes it extremely easy, even if you're not familiar with these tools or models or techniques, to start incorporating them within the tool and driving your analysis forward. Let's touch base on that in a little bit more detail. So I've chosen just a few examples of ways that you can add statistics into your view. And I'm gonna outline some, maybe some use cases or pitfalls, or maybe even what I like about that model. So I'll start with something very simple, the average line and the average line with 95% confidence interval. To add these to the view, what you'll do is you'll navigate to the analytics pane at the top left of the authoring interface. It's gonna open this menu. What you can do is simply drag these options onto the view, onto your sheet, and you'll see this box appear. All you have to do is drop it where you want that line to be drawn and Tableau will, will encode that statistic right there within your sheet. So to quickly walk through what we're looking at here, if we wanted to, to encode across both the Y and X axes, an average line across the entire table, all we have to do is drop it on this choice. If we wanted to look at it by pane, we could drop it on here or cell, we could drop it here. If you wanted to encode it on just one, uh, your X axis or Y axis, you can simply drop it on either column or rows individually, and you'll see that average line drawn across um, just that axis. The average line with 95% confidence interval is exactly the same. However, it adds an upper and lower band um, across that. So you can kind of start to see on average, um, what's the confidence that you know, the next time that this data is um, sampled, will it fall within that average? Um, so that's kind of what you're getting, the value you're getting with the 95% confidence in it. The next statistic is the median with 95% confidence interval. And this is a little redundant of the other two, I understand. It's ex essentially the exact same, um, except it's looking at the median as the statistic rather than the average. And the reason I wanted to highlight this one specifically is because when you pair it with your average, so if you drop an average line and the median, you can really start to draw out some insight. Um, really great way to, to see if there's outliers within your data by dragging in both these statistics and you can visually see that there's outliers. Um, there's other uses for it as well. Uh, I think pairing them together, there's a lot of advantages and you can draw a lot of context out of your view with um, pairing these together. The next, the next stat I'll touch on, excuse me, is the model uh, trend line. So when you drag in trend line to your view, uh, you'll see five different options appear. I'll touch on two of these that I use the most. And that I'll start with the linear line. The linear line is just that. It's gonna draw a straight line through your view. 
And all it's trying to do is minimize the distance between the marks in your view and this line that it's drawing. Once it knows the minimal distance, that's, that's where it draws the trend line. Where you can really start to drive your insights is if you right click on that line, you can view the statistics underneath and see what it's outputting. So now you can start viewing the coefficients and things like that uh, within this model, and that can drive inference of your data. So you can start to see relationships between different data points or different variables. It's a great way to draw insight and uh, some inference on your data. The other tool or model that I'll, I'll touch on for the trend line is the polynomial model. It's exactly the same as the linear, except with the polynomial, you can start adding breaks in your line to fitting your data better. The linear model is gonna work really well if your, your data kind of follows that linear trend, but that's not the case most often. Uh, the polynomial line will allow you to um, break that line and give it some curvature. And you can actually define how many breaks, if you will, are in that line. Um, Tableau makes it very easy to do that by just right-clicking it and changing that option. Again, with the polynomial, very similar to the linear, you can draw a lot of inference by viewing the statistics underneath. Um, I would recommend doing a little bit of research on that just so you know if it's significant and things like that, but um, this is a very powerful and easy way to start drawing inference. The next one I'll touch on is forecasts. And unlike the trend line, I think the forecast is extremely easy to interpret and understand and draw inference from. Even for someone that has no background in statistics, if you draw or drop this into your view, you can really start to see um, the power of it. And what I love about it is if the model doesn't give you good enough results, what you'll see is that it will just draw an average line straight across your view. That tells the user, even someone's not like savvy in this, uh, this modeling and statistics, tells them that there's kind of insufficient data to create a good forecast. So Tableau just draws out the average, could be the average. Um, I, I love that, that it does that because it allows us to start pushing into new realms and things like that and entering into this, this kind of space um, very easily. Um, and it's a really good way to interpret or really easy to interpret. Very similar to the forecast, the clustering technique or model built within Tableau is fantastic. It's extremely easy to uh, interpret, especially if you're working with stakeholders that aren't familiar with these techniques. Um, but you simply drop this into your, into your view when applicable, and it's going to cluster your data um, underneath or under the hood. It does that by just coloring um, the different uh, clusters, and you can actually define how many clusters you want. Um, so if you wanted three, you can define three. If you want five, you can do five. Um, again, this is a very easy thing to interpret. So, you know, if you were trying to cluster your customers into a marketing segment, you can drop this in and you can in easily describe what's going on um, and hopefully team up with someone in your marketing department to kind of figure out what those clusters mean and how you could market towards them. Um, so another great way to kind of plug in statistics within your tools. Now, if you want to take it a step further, um, there are ways that you can connect to tools like R and Python and incorporate coding from R and Python directly within Tableau. Um, I'll touch on how you can get there from Tableau desktop. However, just know that depending on whether you want to use R or Python, there's different tools and, and um, external tools that you need to download on your machine to get that connection to work. From Tableau Desktop, however, if you click on Help in the authoring interface in the top navigation and go to Settings and Performance, if you choose this option, Manage Analytics Extension Connection, this is where you can, can start to connect to R or Python and things like that or other tools. Um, it's a really great way, especially if you're looking to, to, to get into more advanced techniques and statistics to incorporate that within your work. Um, if you're interested in any of that, or you know you want to know more about maybe what you need for the R connection or Python connection, I'll put my contact information at the end. Just feel free to reach out. I'm happy to walk anyone through that process. All right, so going back to our view, we're at the, the fifth layer. I've turned on statistics and we can see that 
I've modeled in a trend line here and I've also built in a forecast. So we can see our forecast of next periods, we're trending down. Um, and that's actually kind of where our trend line is falling to, um, just overall, the overall average. Um, so maybe this is the value we would expect and maybe this uptick was a fluke. So you can start drawing inference like that, um, or at least making those connections and diving in deeper. Um, but this is really gonna find where you're, you're driving that curiosity and, and moving the needle forward. All right, the last layer is theme. I touched on it at the beginning. I think Tableau does a fantastic job of navigating and making it extremely easy for the user to do all those other layers. But this is the one I think Tableau lacks the most is theme. Simple design elements like rounding the corners of an object in your view or adding a shadow kind of feature or effect underneath an object that doesn't come natively within Tableau. Um, a lot of times or most of the time, almost every time actually, folks, if they introduce that stuff into their Tableau public or you know, their work that they're doing in Tableau, they're looking to outside tools to kind of build those design elements and then they incorporate them in the tool itself. So some tools that I've identified that I've found personally useful and I've used in, in the past. One is Figma, which is this logo to the left that's kind of colorful. Figma is a free tool. Anyone can go to figma.com and create an account and you can start building out design elements right there within the tool. It's extremely easy, very intuitive. And like I said, it's free. The other tool I've identified is Adobe XD. Again, very intuitive. However, Adobe XD does require a subscription um, to that software. It's a licensed product. The good thing about that is if you can build a use case and a business case, you might be able to position that to your business um, to get a license. And that license is gonna come with a creative suite of other tools that Adobe has. For instance, Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. Um, those tools will give you a lot more ability to, to build these design elements. And then they have different features that aren't native within Figma. Um, so again, it's a little bit more, um, it's gonna be a, a subscribe service. Um, but you get a little bit more bang, obviously, for the buck. Um, I personally use Figma. It fits my needs just perfectly most of the time. Um, so that's where I find myself. Now, going back to our workbook, I turned on the last layer theme, and we can kind of see everything come to life. This is where it's going to start adding professional polish to the tool as well. And I really think that adding theme, incorporating architecture and design within your tools is gonna to drive adoption of your tools as well. Um, it's, it's, it's really putting on that professional polish. You can see once I've turned on theme, I've added a header. Um, I've added some instruction here uh, on how to use the tool. I've added in labels on all of our toggles. I've added in a border and some shadowing effect around some of the architecture. So there's very subtle things that kind of make this, this come to life, if you will. Okay, I'm gonna hop out of presentation mode and I'm going to go to that workbook and show you guys that in real time. So I built this, I, I published it to my Tableau public. I'll send you guys the link in chat um, before we close today. But I wanted to take you through this because as we all know, this is a great idea walking through these step by step and you you have the perfect visualization in the world but in a real life situation it never works out that way right um so i wanted to show you guys this to kind of drive the, the fact home that this isn't a linear process i mean there are steps we have to connect the data first before we can do anything um but other than that you know we might find ourselves choosing a line or a chart type and then adding in a statistic, or maybe you find out that chart type's not the right one and you might change it. Um, or maybe you add in color and then, you know, you decide, oh, you know, it's, it's green and red. That's probably bad. My stakeholder might be colorblind. Um, so you can change that. Um, so it is a fluid kind of architecture. But to drive that fact home, um, if you come to this workbook and I'll send it to you guys so you can play around, but you can start toggling these things off. So for instance, I can remove aesthetics. Oh, let's see, it's gonna load. 
I can remove aesthetics and we can see that the color drops off the view and we're left with just the line chart with you know, a trend line for the statistic. Um, I can turn off the theme. So you can see the architecture goes, um, we've kind of lost that professional polish um, that the theme incorporated within the tool. Um, I can turn off the filtering. So now we've lost the ability to kind of go through here and toggle on those different features or to slice and dice the data appropriately. Um, I can turn off the mark type. So now you can see we've connected the data, but we haven't encoded anything or vice versa. I can, I can have a mark type in my head. Maybe I know that it's the line chart that I want, but if I haven't connected to any data, we've, we're just left with two blank axes um, with nothing in it. So this is a great way you can kind of play around and, and maybe it'll drive understanding of what each of these layers represents. So I did just want to preview that briefly. I'm going to jump back over into the tool or sorry, the presentation. And before we get to questions, I just want to briefly touch on um, some different resources that are out there that have helped me um, hopefully share some tactics that you guys can maybe incorporate as well. Um, one thing that's helped me obviously is Tableau Public. Tableau Public is a fantastic tool that the community has. Now, for me myself, I've always been a little hesitant to publish and build a portfolio in Tableau Public. Um, you know, we see all the time, we see these most beautiful infographics that people have built and chart types. But a lot of us that use and develop with Tableau, I mean, we're really oriented around business making decisions, um, which only, always aren't, you know, it's not going to be an infographic. A lot of us are really skilled at building out these tools that you could use to make data driven decisions, but not necessarily tell a compelling story in an infographic kind of way. So I've always been hesitant. However, on the reverse of that, there's a ton of cool stuff out there. And if you go to Tableau Public, you'll see the community is so open. Not only are they publishing their work for other people to, to view and to see and to get inspired by, but they also make it to where you can download these workbooks, re-engineer what they've done and figure out how that works. I've always found that fascinating. And I've used Tableau Public in that aspect, just me personally, um, quite a bit to, to upskill myself in the background and to kind of, um, you know, build out my own skill set using things that I find fascinating and I can learn at the same time. It's extremely useful. Other resources in the community, I want to touch just a little bit on Playfair stuff. We do offer a virtual flagship training now, which is 100% virtual. Um, our next one is going to be in April. And this is kind of a, an event where, um, just like our in person flagship training, um, you'll hear from Ryan and he'll take you through that training opportunity. The next one is our Play for Data blog. We blog religiously, probably a blog once a week. I just published one yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, three innovative ways to zoom in Tableau. Um, so it's really interesting. You can find a lot of stuff there, especially if you're stuck on something you're trying to figure out. Most likely you can go to a blog like ours or any others, others in the community, and uh, you can start finding different ways to get yourself through those, those uh, issues that you're running into. Another is the Play for Data TV platform. We have over 24 plus hours of Playfair Data TV recorded now. And not only are you hearing different tips and tactics, but there's a lot of strategical things you can implement within your work as well. Um, for instance, knowing your audience or being able to engage with your audience better, drive adoption of their, your tools. You can find that stuff in Playfair Data TV as well. The last is consulting. Um, so we do do consulting uh, with businesses really all over the world. Um, it's exciting stuff. Uh, if you guys are interested in working with us, definitely feel free to reach out to me um, or reach out to us on our, on our website. Other resources in the community that I absolutely love and follow, one is the Flareless Twins. Their blog is awesome. Um, I've always found it fascinating and they always have really cool content that is very practical and that you can implement within kind of your day-to-day, -day, if you will. Another is the best of Tableau web. <clears throat> this is a monthly blog or newsletter that goes out that Tableau has on their website featured. 
Um, I think the authors, Andy Cogreve and um, Mark, I'm drawing a blank on the last name, but they've been publishing these each month. It's fantastic. Um, it's a great way to take a look back at what was published last month. They, they come through all the blogs for you and they bring those highlights right there to the top. Another good one is the DataFam Roundup. This is very similar to the best of Tableau, except it's weekly and they'll actually post like different upcoming events and stuff like that. Um, so you can kind of stay in touch with the community as well. The last one I'll touch on as far as resources for the best of Tableau web, Andy Cockreve published this workbook, excuse me, in Tableau public. It is all the blogs that he follows and is subscribed to, to build out the best of Tableau web. It's a great resource to just peruse through and you know find uh, maybe there's a name out there you're familiar with you'll you can subscribe right there to their blog you can just click the link and go straight to the blog and subscribe um, it's a great very consolidated resource you can use to go through and find out what's out there in the community but that's all i have for today uh, before we open up the questions here's my contact information if you're interested in reaching out um, my email, ethan at playfordata.com. My Twitter, I'm trying to get into Twitter. I have like 20 followers. So if you want to help bump that up, uh, follow me at Visual Lang. Um, and then my LinkedIn, here's my LinkedIn uh, URL, but it's just Ethan slash Lang and then a forward slash. Um, but I'll open it up to any questions. Awesome. <clears throat> awesome job, uh, Ethan. That was really, that was really cool. Um, great stuff. No, I haven't seen any, um, haven't seen any Q and A, uh, stuff, but, uh, I kind of followed, followed along as you kind of went through there and dropped in some, uh, resources, some of the links, uh, blog posts that you mentioned. So. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah. Thanks for that. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, you bet. So yeah, that was really good stuff. Um, I had a lot of, um, it's an interesting, um, it's it's an interesting approach, and and um, you know that the interactive dashboard that you showed that you can actually toggle on and off is um, a really great way to um, really drive those things home. So um, I'll be uh, I'll be taking advantage of that in uh, in some training classes that I do. So great job. Yeah, man. here I'll I'll drop it in the chat for everybody. Perfect. Um, that's the link to it on Tableau Public. So feel free to go through there and peruse. Awesome, good, good stuff. Uh, any other comments from the uh, from the panelists about uh, what Ethan just uh, had to share? No, just to say thank you. I love I love seeing different ways of sort of different paradigms for thinking about the work we do, and um, that sort of layering effect I think is such a helpful um, way not just to think about like how it all comes together, but also when you're struggling to be able to take a step back and be like, all right, you don't have to think of the whole thing at once. Which layer am I in and how can I focus on that? So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much for sure. taking the time. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. And I hope everyone got uh, value out of it for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and shift gears here. Um, we're going to talk quickly uh, about something very exciting coming up. Uh, next week, which is Tableau Conference. Um, so I am excited to uh, attend next year's conf or uh, next week's conference. It's going to be a good time. Um, and we are, let's see, make sure I'm on it here. Can you guys see, are you guys seeing the Tableau? Kind of, it's like the top bar of your browser weird so we we, hold on let me oh there it is there it is that works yeah. yeah all right there it is it kind of come on there we go all right is this better no, no. Uh, no. <laughs> it's not all right hold on let's uh let's stop this here <laughs> let's stop share and let's reshare and let's figure this out there we go. That's what I wanted. That looks great. 
Yeah. Okay, good. All right, tc.tableau.com, uh, tc21.tableau.com. Uh, it is next week, uh, starting on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday afternoon at 11 a.m. Central is when the kickoff is the opening keynote. It is free, so you don't have to pay anything uh, to attend. They've got a bunch of uh, shows, and it's all around the clock. Uh, so they're doing it in three different time zones, so every, every single session will be able to view uh, several times throughout the week. And... Um, so you can go here, you can see the broadcast schedule again. It will be defaulted. This broadcast schedule is going to be defaulted to your web browser's time zone. Uh, so again, if you want to see, uh, you know, I think it's, if you want to go, if you're, if you can't sleep on uh, Wednesday morning and you're up at 3 a.m. and you want to watch the keynote again, you can do that. Um, but uh, probably what's going to be more beneficial is uh, if you go to all episodes uh, here, you'll be able to uh, see all of the different sessions and be able to, uh, you can add them to your list, which will then sync to your uh, calendar. Uh, so you can actually block out some time, uh, which, is, uh, which is always good. I've got a bunch of different fil filters here uh, that you can do. Um, and you, know, you can filter this by, you know, by topic. Uh, so there's some really good stuff in here. So if you just wanted to see uh, maybe you're maybe you're excited with Tableau Prep. Here are all of the different sessions that are related to using Tableau Prep. Um, so you know, bunch of cool stuff uh, on here. But wanted to take a moment and uh, just kind of go around the go around the table and see uh, from our panelists uh, what you are most looking forward to and any tips you have for maybe people who are new to the Tableau conference, uh, virtual Tableau conference, and what they can get out of it. So I will start with our uh, esteemed guest, Mr. Ethan. What do you got? Cool. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing from me, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the three things that I, I would say you, you just absolutely can miss, one is going to be the keynote. It's going to give you a little insight into the business and, and maybe what's transpired last year in the past. Um, and then maybe even some insight into what they're thinking of moving into the future. Um, so I think the keynote is, is definitely key. I wouldn't miss that. The next one is Iron Viz. goes without saying that's probably the most like exciting thing of Tableau Conference is Iron Viz. Mm -hmm. I participated this year and submitted for the first time. Like it was really exciting and fun, but man, it was challenging. Um, the next one is devs on stage. Um, again, this is going to give you insight into, you know, what, what they're thinking, what, what the future looks like at Tableau. Um, you know, maybe they're going to probably highlight some really cool feature that they're about to release soon. Um, so that's always an interesting one to me. Those are the three things I would say you absolutely just cannot miss. You have to watch them. Um, another thing though, to keep in mind, um, I know it's an all day event. And we all have our, our times probably blocked with work and everything, especially with this being virtual again. Um, but just know that these are recorded. So if you can't miss, if you do miss one, um, check back on the YouTube channel. It'll be up there and you can watch the recording. So keep that in mind. Yep. That's my, that's my take. Awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, Iron Viz is, uh, I would just echo Iron Viz. Definitely check that out. It's pretty amazing uh, to watch, to watch practitioners in our uh, in our tool to creating amazing visualizations uh, in under 20 minutes, which uh, is is pretty incredible. So definitely, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, let's go with Aaron next. What do you got, Aaron? What, what do you yeah. look forward to? Um, so I would echo everything that Ethan said, um, definitely. Um, and then there are a couple of things. So um, the Tableau Viz Gallery is supposed to be back in a virtual way. I feel like they haven't really advertised that too much. I like had to go searching for it in, you know, advertising slides and they have like one mention of it somewhere on the main conference page, but they say it's going to be back. So I remember from last year being so impressed with the sort of gallery that they created um, for anyone who got uh, sort of 
pulled into Animal Crossing um, in the <laughs> whole pandemic time. It really felt like going into a museum in that sort of capacity and getting to interact with these, um, the you know, the best of Tableau Public, which, uh, you know, is there's so many great resources out there. It's lovely to have this sort of curated collection that um, is really inspiring. So I would point to that. Um, my strategy with TC has always been to look at who's speaking. I wish there were an easier way, frankly, in this capacity to see all of the speakers and then click directly on, you know, those individuals that you're really excited to hear speak. But um, that's something that I would I would just always recommend is, you know, you can go to the details on any of these and you can see who's speaking. Um, and uh, that has been so fun to be able to sort of follow people who sometimes present at multiple conferences who do a really fantastic job. Um, and, you know, they're, they're here's a, a great one, like Kevin, like the twins, I'm going to go see what they're, they're presenting on. I have it saved sort of regardless of what the, the content is. Um, so check out the speakers make sure they're, you know, you're excited about them. Um, the other thing I'll just highlight uh, two sessions that I'm really looking forward to that are all women. Um, the speed tipping this year and Jackson and two other women are going to be doing. I love a good sp speed tipping round. It's just always a favorite. So that comes to mind. Um, and then there's data plus women plus you, which um, I've attended uh, several times at TC and just always been so inspired by. I would especially encourage men to attend as well. Um, I feel like that group does a really fantastic job of, of incorporating everyone into that conversation. Um, and so I'm excited to see that they have a virtual presence here as well. So those are those are the highlights I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are, if you're interested in this, um, I would just tack on to the Data Plus Women. There are there are virtual events that uh, the Data Plus Women do similar to uh, Tableau user groups. So uh, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, definitely check that out. They've, they're, they're a pretty active, um, they're a pretty active community as well. So definitely uh, check that out. So yeah, and the, and the Viz Gallery is pretty amazing. Like it's a, it's a full on uh, interactive experience. It's not just a, uh, it's not just a kind of a, a scrolling of, a, of several different visits. It's it's like you walk into a museum type of thing and they've got very calming Zen music playing. And so it's it's a it's a pretty cool thing. So definitely uh, definitely check that out. Uh, all right. Uh, Lucas, what do you look forward to when it comes to conference? All right. Well just just wanted to reiterate a, a quick point, Sean, that you've pretty much already made, but just that there's there's so many options that there's definitely something for for everyone. So myself, what I what I like to focus on when it comes to conference, besides the sessions that um, Ethan brought up, is at least this year focusing heavily on on the dev side of things, um, AI, ML, augmented analytics, um, natural language processing. So if you're a geek for that stuff, like I am, um, I've signed up for some some of those um, sessions as well. Our company is going through a big stride right now into data democratization. So there's sessions covering that as well, that you can govern your data and do self-service analytics at the same time. So I'm, I'm excited to see and, and get some insights from that. Um, and just roadmap of, of Tableau. I think there's a, another session that talks about how they're coming up with a product that will tell us what data has changed from refreshes, um, which is, you know, a big problem that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm excited to watch that as well. But in addition to that, I think another great point that comes with the conference are the, the brain dates. Um, we focus a lot on the sessions itself themselves, but, and I think you're, you're even giving some of those um, or you're participating, Sean. I think I saw your avatar on a couple of them. And yep. it's just, so the brain dates just give you more exposure and in, in the, the connection with those with those speakers the sessions you're just kind of taking them in and you might be able to ask a question here here or there but brain dates really allow you that time the the one-on-one -on -one or close to a one-on-one -on -one time that you can share and discuss that that topic of interest so something i definitely wanted to point out that mm -hmm. I find it's pretty unique with the conference and that everybody should maybe take a look into it yep yep i uh I'll go ahead and uh, do mine. We'll have uh, Jay finish this up. So yes, one of the things that I was going to say was I was going to bring up brain dates because uh, as you can see, there are hundreds of different sessions uh, and they're all, they're widespread. 
right? And you may be having a specific, uh, you may have a specific question that you want to get answered. Uh, and it's unfortunately not a session topic. That's where brain dates come in. Uh, so let me uh, just quickly show you uh, what uh, the, the brain date platform is. So if you saw, you go up here, ways to connect, uh, and it's going to open a new tab, and then you have you launch brain date, uh, and then what you can what this is this is kind of the marketplace, right? Uh, you can go in here, and as you can see, uh, these are group brain dates that people in the community who are I mean there are over almost 1,200 people now who have signed up uh, to host uh, a brain date session on anything and everything, uh, you know. So definitely check out this. I particularly enjoy brain dates because um, after you've been using the tool for a long time, like there's not much that you can really get out of a, a session that you don't already know. Um, and what I go to conference for now, uh, after you know going to several uh, in person, uh, what I go to conferences now for is the networking uh, and the person face to face interactions uh, and unfortunately in virtual conferences that's not possible but with brain dates that's a way to kind of get that in uh, and so this is where I so yes as, as Luke mentioned or as uh, Lucas mentioned I do have several uh, I am hosting several and I actually let's see if I have any I don't have any open spots I might have to open some uh, but you know you you can go in here and you can say i want to talk so i'm doing a couple uh two of them uh where i'm going to talk about dashboard templates and how to implement uh a dashboard template across your enterprise so how to develop it how to kind of create it how to share it how to adopt it uh and then how to implement it so uh i got another one here where we're just going to talk about music and data uh we're just going to have an open discussion and talk about and see what we can see and make some connections um so uh definitely check this out because it's awesome um and if you're looking for that you know networking uh thing that's definitely the thing to check out the other thing if you're on if you're a slack uh if you're a slack fan since salesforce and tableau are now uh slack and since salesforce owns slack now and salesforce owns tableau and Salesforce owns the world. Uh, Slack is going to be part of uh, part of Tableau Conference now. Uh, so if you want to launch, if you want to interact with Tableau Conference via Slack, you can. Uh, they're going to have a Slack channel for each session, uh, for each channel, and for each time zone. Uh, so if that's your if that's your thing, uh, go ahead and sign up there as well. So uh, and then the only thing I would add, definitely go see Iron Viz. Uh, that's that's what I would say. So, all right, Lucas or Jay, take us home. What do you got? Um, well, there's been a lot said already, but <laughs> I would say have a strategy going into it. Um, you know, what you're going to focus around, like Lucas said, he was going to go heavy on the dev side. Um, last year, last couple of years, I've been really heavy on the design side to help improve those skills. I think it's worked a lot. Um, this year, I'm going to do a little bit of each, you know, one design session one organization session, I think one dev session. Um, so there are a lot of sessions. I would block your calendar out for stuff you don't want to miss um, to let everyone know that you'll be busy. Um, I've done that, but left some time open, you know, just have it on in the background. We're actually going to gather at work and like have a few people just sit around and, and watch it together while we work. So yeah, organize something like that at your office as well if you're going in. Um, I'm going to go in just for this, but, um, yeah. Uh, and then when we go back in person next year, hopefully if you're interested in the technical side, the training sessions are amazing. Um, so that is something to look forward to when we go back. There's also the Tableau doctor sessions that are there. So if you're having issues and want, um, a consultation with a Tableau expert, then sign up for one of those. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Doctor sessions are great. Doctor session is a, a longer one-on-one -on -one session with either a Tableau product person, somebody who actually works for Tableau, or you get to or you get to sign up with a Tableau Zen master uh, to actually go and you can actually like have them, you know, diagnose your dashboard issue or workbook issue. So, um, which is a really great way to kind of get that uh, get a quick fix 
in uh, if, if that's something that you're needing. So, uh, so to answer, we got one uh, from John. We've got, does anyone know if Tableau will go back to annual in-person conferences next year? I sure hope so. Um, I, yeah, I hope so. Uh, but obviously nothing confirmed yet. Uh, and I doubt we'll find out uh, at the end of next, uh, next week. I, I think they're probably going to wait and see what happens. So, um, but considering how the things have gone uh, in recent, in the recent months and last 18 months, and things are continuing to get better, I would imagine that, uh, that we will, um, but time will tell on that. So uh, we'll see. Uh, speaking of networking, uh and getting together so last uh well as you signed up for this you answered a poll question about in-person tug events uh and we had quite a few people uh talk uh or quite a few people answer that uh, i think i've got it pulled up here yep so we had 110 responses 36 of uh of the responses said uh in person or online is fine as long as i get to learn which is great uh, 20 people said, yes, I can't wait to get back in person, but we also had uh, a significant portion of people who said they're not quite comfortable getting back together uh, just yet. So, but, so we're going to try and thread the needle uh, a little bit, and uh, we do recognize the need for getting back together face-to-face, -to -face, but we don't want people who don't want to, uh, who aren't comfortable yet, uh, to kind of, uh, we don't want to pressure them in any way. So, what we're going to do is probably we're going to be doing something quarterly uh, starting off. We're going to do something quarterly uh, to um, do something face to face. It may be just a networking happy hour type of thing. It may and there may not be any uh, you know content, uh, specific content. Or if there is, we'll figure out a way to uh, kind of broadcast that out. So. Uh, if you are looking to, uh, if you're looking for both, we'll kind of have a, a hybrid meetup. So, um, so be looking forward to that as we kind of go into 22, um, we will start to get back together. But we also have heard uh, from a lot of people that they really enjoy the online platform because uh, they're able to fit it in between meetings without commutes, um, right? So that's, uh, but, but then also you get to kind of take off the rest of the afternoon if you, if we are in person. So it's kind of a catch 22. Um, but continuing on that, I'm working on getting something set up so that next Thursday afternoon, after conference is wrapped, I'm going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to get together. Uh, no pressure. Again, no content. It's just going to be a happy hour. Uh, be looking for an invite later this week uh, to just give you kind of the details of where that's going to be and what time and, and what you can expect. So more to come on that, but we are going to get together next week after the conference uh, to kind of get together with whoever wants to uh, and uh, just have a beer and talk about how awesome Tableau is. So um, with that, I think uh, I'll give everybody in the panel one last go around. Anybody have any comments, questions, concerns, thoughts? One last thing. Yeah. In case you are working in a job and Tableau Conference is happening and the general um, environment is not as conducive to being able to uh, turn off sort of the rest of your world to even get a few snippets of Tableau Conference, because I know that's a real situation for people remind whoever your bosses or your organization or whatever you can do that tableau conference attending is very expensive so if we are back in person next year and all of this is now behind a paywall of thousand plus dollars plus travel plus hotel i mean it's like a two to three grand investment per person who goes to tc that these are the same fantastic thinkers that are presenting and so i don't know if you you know if you're blocking off your calendar maybe in the comments put like hey just a reminder this is the equivalent of you know thousands of dollars of professional development and try to just as a little snippet in case that helps protect anyone's time next week because i know how easy it is to let these kind of things slip by yep that's a that's a great point other than that enjoy <laughs> yes cool all right well with that Thank you, Ethan, again, for your presentation. That was awesome. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us today. We really appreciated that. Um, 
And yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have to have you on again uh, sometime in the future. So if you ever, you always have a home here in Kansas City. So anytime you've got a new presentation or new material or content you want to share, just let us know. Cool. And that, yeah, goes, we'll for, do. And that goes for the rest of everyone on this call. So please don't hesitate to raise your voice, raise your hand, tell us you want to share something and we'll, we'll, we'll get it figured out. So, uh, all right. I'm going to stop yammering uh, and uh, let you all have 15 minutes back. So thank you so much. Have a great week. Have a great month. We'll talk to you again in December. See ya.